Good morning, folks. We are glad you're here this morning. We're going to welcome you and uh, get things started here. We are so glad that you have come today and joined us, and uh, we're excited to see what God has got for us today. So we're going to pray. We're going to get this thing underway and uh, see where it goes. Let's bow together. Father, we thank you for this day. God, I do thank you for each and every one who is here in this room, God. Um, we just, we know that we are here because you have got something to say to us. Father, I believe that there is no one here by accident. God, whether it's in the room or if it's online, I believe everyone who is here, God, is here to receive a word from you. So God, just be with us today as we worship you. God, just uh, inhabit our praise. Father, let us simply lift up our hearts to you. God, let us uh, just simply stand in awe of who you are and worship your name. Worship you, God, simply because you are worthy of all glory and all honor and all praise. <clears throat> and just speak to hearts today, God. We are here for that. We are here for you. So, Father, just uh, speak to us. Let our hearts be ready to be changed by your word, God. Father, we, uh, we want to leave this place knowing you better. We want to leave this place reflecting you in this world better. So just uh, be with us now as we do all of that, Father. We pray it in your precious name. Amen. So let's lift our voices together. Let's come and let's praise our Father in heaven. That's what we're here for today, is to hear from him and to worship him. So let's do that together right now and praise his name. Glory come down. 
Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. I worship Your holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I worship Your holy name. Sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. <clears throat> whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be seen. time has come still my soul will sing your praise on it First of all, because he's worthy. 
because he deserves it. And that alone is enough. But to pile on top of that, there's the fact that he can take broken people like you and like me, unworthy people like me, and he can use them for his glory. He can fix our brokenness. He can turn us into something good, something useful. He asks us, he invites us into his family to be called by his name. And uh, so as we continue worshiping, we're going to sing about the fact that he can turn bones into living, breathing armies. He can take something that's broken and make it useful. Let's lift him up. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. desire is now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing nothing is better Yes. 
it out together. Lift it up. one of the many reasons we worship him. I believe he is here in this room right now. And I want us just to continue worshiping his holy name and inviting him to just simply move in this place as we study his word, as we worship. We want to simply invite his spirit to be free to move in this place, to be free to change our hearts. Let's let him know that we are welcoming him into this place. That we are welcoming him to come and to, to change literally who we are. Make us more like him. Let's worship him. Atmosphere is changing now. Cause the spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the spirit of the Lord is here. The atmosphere is changing. Now, for the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the Spirit of the Lord is here. Overflow in this place, fill our hearts with your love. Atmosphere is changing now. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the Spirit of the Lord is here. The atmosphere is changing. Now, for the spirit. 
is all around that the spirit of the Lord is here overflow in this place fill our hearts with your love your love surrounds us you're the reason we
the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the Spirit of the Lord is pray together Father that's our prayer this morning that a miracle would happen in this place that dry bones dry empty lives God would be revived would have your breath of life breathed into us Father speak to our hearts God, awaken our hearts. Wake us up, Father, for you. God, let us leave this place bringing glory to you and to your name. Father, we are here for you. Speak to us now, God. We pray it in your name. Amen. Amen, amen. Good morning to you. Welcome. So honored to have you today. It is a beautiful day to gather in the Lord's house. Welcome those who are here in the room. We welcome those who are joining us online as well. Wherever you happen to be, it's an honor to have you. And we especially want to say hello to those who are here for the very first time or watching for the very first time. If you are here in the room, I hope you received a worship guide when you came in. It looks like this. As we tell you every week, there's lots of ministries going on, lots of ways that you can be involved in ministry. And if you are here for the first time, we'd like to welcome you personally. If you would do us a favor and tear off this little side section, the little tear off slip. Give us a little bit of your information so we can say hello to you. You could drop it in one of the offering boxes or give it to one of the folks at the hub. But we want to say hello to you personally. We'd also love to pray for you no matter how many times you've been here. That's what the backside of the slip is for. Writing a prayer need or a spiritual question you have. Or remember the email address prayer at firstmelissa.com. Easy to use, prayer at firstmelissa.com. This summer we have things that are happening every week and we have things that are special events. Every week we gather right here in this room, Tuesday morning, 7 a.m. We study the weekly Torah portion or, or it's called Parashah HaShavua in Hebrew, but we study the weekly Torah portion at 7 a.m. every week and we have a great group of folks if you'd like to get up early and study the Word of God with us. Tuesday morning you can. Every Wednesday during the summer we are doing different kinds of events. And this week it is dinner and a movie night. We have Italian food dinner coming up this Wednesday. Dinner begins at 5.30 p.m. You can make a reservation. It's listed in here. And the movie begins at 6.30 right here in this room. So we'd love for you to come and get to know some new people and have a good time of friendship this Wednesday at 6.30. We have a kids camp that leaves tomorrow morning, and we have a high school camp coming up July 10 through 14, those who have completed grades 9 through 12, so you want to get your high schoolers signed up for that. We have vacation Bible school coming up the following week, July 19 through 23, so if you have preschoolers or kids in elementary grades, you're going to want to sign them up for Vacation Bible School. And you've already heard, I think, about our brand new weekday preschool that's opening in August called Arrow Academy. Registration is beginning there. All of this information you can find out in your worship guide. You can find out at our website, firstmelissa.com, or on our phone app. I hope you have downloaded that the First Melissa app to whatever phone you have. You can give to our ministries. You can sign up for events. You can see messages and listen to teachings all at our First Melissa app. And everything we do is because we are generous as a body of believers and the members of our congregation do this together. And part of that is inviting new friends. Part of that is volunteering in ministry. And part of that is giving financially. We mentioned the offering boxes that are here and by the doors in the foyer. We mentioned the app. Some prefer Venmo, the very easy website, firstmelissa.com slash give. But we all do this together. Everything we do, we do together, including the financial support of this ministry. And today I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story that will make you think. A story that will make you ask a lot of questions. Our series is titled Epic Tales 2, and we're teaching you some of the most interesting, some of the most famous stories in your Bible. This 
series is all from that second part of your Bible that we call the New Testament. And as I tell you this story that I told you is going to make you think, I'm going to ask you a few beginning questions and ask you, did you know this? Did you know we live in a pretend world? Did you know we live in a selfish world? Did you know we live in a dishonest world? That's what we're going to talk about today, pretending and selfishness and dishonesty. And we're going to learn that these are not new problems. Yes, that is true. All of that is true about America in the 21st century. But it's not a new problem. And we're also going to learn that followers of Jesus are not immune from these sins. Lying and pride and arrogance. So what I want to do is ask you to go with me to the book of Acts. Please, it's in that second part of your Bible that we call the New Testament, Acts chapters 4 and 5. I want to read the story straight through. We'll come back and break it down for you verse by verse, but I want you to hear the story in its entirety. Acts chapter 4, we're going to begin in verse 32. As always, if you brought your own scriptures, follow along, look on your phone app, or of course the scriptures will be on the screen. Acts 4, verse 32. Let me read it straight through for you so we can come back and talk about it afterwards. Acts 4, 32. Remember, this is the time of the early church. Jesus has been crucified and resurrected and ascended to heaven. He's not physically on the earth anymore. And that first generation of Christ followers are trying to figure out, what do we do now? Acts 4, verse 32. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of land or houses would sell them. And bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet. And they would be distributed to each as any had need. Now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, the island of Cyprus, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles. Barnabas was his nickname. It means the son of encouragement. He owned a tract of land. He sold it and brought the money And laid it at the apostles' feet. Next verse is the next chapter, 5 1. But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge. And bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came over all who heard it. The young man got up, covered him up, and after carrying him out, they buried him. Now there elapsed an interval of about three hours. And his wife came in, Sapphira not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, why is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead. And they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came over the whole church 
and over all who heard of these things. At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's portico. Now we read it straight through just so you hear the story. Just so you understand what was happening. And I'm going to assume some questions come to your mind as you read this. Some of, the, some of you, this is a familiar story. Some of this is brand new to some of our friends. And you're going to ask questions like, why did the story happen this way? They worked together, a husband and wife. They lied Peter, the apostle, confronted them and they died. Why did the story happen this way? A second question is, why is this story in the Bible? Remember, God picks only what he wants to pick to be in his word. The only stories that are there because God, the author, chose them to be there. And he obviously chose this story to be here. Why? Well, this story takes place about 2,000 years ago from where we sit today. And a minute ago, I said, you know, we live in a pretend world and we live in a dishonest world. And I think we all agree. So now we know that it's at least a 2,000 year old problem that we have a pretend world and a dishonest world. But you need to know this story is not the first time in your scriptures that a situation of honesty and integrity was told. And there being great consequences for dishonesty. If we go back 2,000 years from today, we get to Ananias and Sapphira. If you go back about 1,400 years before that, you get to the book of Joshua. And I want to show you something in Joshua chapter 6 and 7. Before we come back and tell you all about Ananias and Sapphira, I want, to know, I want you to know that this is not a new problem. Now, we've told you the story and When you talk about epic tales of your Bible, one of the most famous epic tales of all, of course, is Joshua and the Battle of Jericho, the people of Israel entering the promised land after they had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Joshua is the new leader after the death of Moses. And remember what the Lord said, they were to walk around the city of Jericho for seven days. For the first six days, they were to walk around the city one time per day. And we've learned that that wouldn't take that long, maybe 45 minutes, maybe an hour. What do you do the rest of the day? Well, you're waiting on God to do what God's going to do. But on the seventh day, you're to walk around it seven full times. That's where we pick up the story in Joshua 6, verse 15. On the seventh day, they rose early at the dawning of the day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. Only on that day, the seventh day, did they march around the city seven times. At the seventh time when the priest blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. But Joshua had given them instructions. Verse 17, the city shall be under the ban. It and all that is in it belongs to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot and all who were in her house with her shall live because she hid the messengers whom we sent. Joshua says, but as for you, Only keep yourselves from the things under the ban so that you do not covet them and take some of the things under the ban and make the camp of Israel accursed and bring trouble on it. But all the silver and the gold and the articles of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. Joshua says, be careful guys. We're going to take this city. God's going to let us have victory in this battle, but you're probably going to be tempted to steal their stuff. You're going to be tempted to be dishonest, to be a liar and a thief. Don't do it. We skip a few more verses down to chapter 7, verse 1. It says, but the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully in regard to the things under the ban. A guy named Achan, and there's his family tree, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah from the tribe of Judah, took some of the things under the ban. Therefore, the anger of the Lord burned against the sons of Israel. And then the people of Israel begin to feel the consequences of this judgment. They go into another battle and they're defeated. And then Joshua is grieving because he says, Lord, you brought us into this land. Why are you letting us be defeated? So skip down to verse 7. Joshua said, alas, O Lord, 
why did you ever bring this people over the Jordan? That's the river from Je- by Jericho into the promised land. Only to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. If only we had been willing to live be- beyond the Jordan. Oh Lord, what can I say since Israel has turned their back before the enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it. And they will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? Joshua, who doesn't know what Achan has done, is saying, God, why didn't you protect us in the battle? Your name's going to be dishonored because you haven't protected your people. But the Lord replies to him in verse 10, rise up. Why is it that you have fallen on your face? Israel has sinned and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. They have even taken some of the things under the ban. They have both stolen and deceived. Moreover, they have put them among their own things. Therefore, the sons of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become accursed. And look what God says. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy the things under the ban from your midst. We're going to talk about Ananias and Sapphira in a second, but understand, we serve the God who is the same. His nature never changes. And here he says, Joshua, you want me to protect you. You want me to guide you. You want me to bless you. But you guys have chosen to disobey me. You have chosen to hear my instructions and completely disregard them. And in a frightening sentence, God says, I will not be with you anymore until you destroy the things under the ban from your midst. Verse 13, so the Lord said to Joshua, rise up, consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus the Lord, the God of Israel has said, these are the things under the ban in your midst. O Israel, you cannot stand before your enemies until you remove the things under the ban from your midst. So Joshua rose early in the morning. He brought them all together. And he began to go through kind of a survey. They cast lots and they they went down from, from a tribe to a family to a clan to a specific household, a specific tent. And they got to the man named Achan. And Joshua said to them, my son, I implore you, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give praise to him. Tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. See, we are tempted to lie. But most of the time, we have the opportunity to come straight. To tell the truth. Tell me now what you've done. So if you have your own text and you want to be careful about how you live, you might want to underline a couple of words in Joshua 7 verse 20. So Achan answered Joshua and said, truly I have sinned against the Lord. He sinned against his fellow Israelites, but ultimately he sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. And this is what I did, watch. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight, then I coveted them and took them And behold, they are concealed in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath it. We call this the progressive nature of sin. Guess what? If any of us are honest today, we'll admit this is how we live. We see something. We decide we want that. So we take it. And then we don't want anybody to know so we conceal it. These are the steps. He said, yeah, I, I know the rule. I knew the pro- prohibition from the Lord. But then I saw it and it looked great. It looked interesting. It looked pleasurable. It looked fun. I saw it. But then I didn't walk away. I coveted it. I, I lusted for it. So I took it. But then I wanted to pretend it didn't happen so I concealed it and what happened well Achan was stoned by the punishment for the people of Israel so you say I thought we were talking about Ananias and Sapphira why are we reading about Achan because these stories have several things in common 
You see the list. Number one, they both happen amid new beginnings. This is very important to understand. The people of Israel are just now entering the promised land. This is a new era, a new phase for the people of Israel. In the book of Acts, this is the first century church, the first group of believers who have to follow Jesus without being in the physical presence of Jesus. This is brand new. And what God is doing is he is protecting this new thing he is doing. He is trying to preserve the future by dealing severely in the present. Obviously, both events have to do with greeds and possession and taking things and being greedy about what we have. And then the third thing they have in common is that there's swift punishment. And corporate punishment. That one person's sin or one couple's sin affects more than just themselves. So now that we know what the story of Ananias and Sapphira is, and now we know that they weren't the first people to deal with their greed and their dishonesty, let's go back and let me show you what we should learn, I believe, from this story. Acts chapter 5. We'll return there. We have the man named Ananias and his wife's name is Sapphira. His name Ananias means God is gracious. God shows grace is the man's name. And then his wife's name is Sapphira. Her name means beautiful and of course it's related to a name for the precious stone, the sapphire. And they own a piece of property. Did they inherit it? Did they buy it? Who knows? They own a piece of property and they sold it. And they kept back a portion of the price. It says, it says very clearly, with his wife's full knowledge, with his wife's full knowledge, So they're in agreement together. They brought a portion of it and they laid it at the feet of the apostles, the leaders of the church. They brought this land sale, the proceeds. And they brought it to the church and said, we know that everybody here is choosing to share, choosing to minister to other people by giving to the ministry. But Peter knew something was wrong. Peter knew something was different. So he says, why has Satan filled your heart? Why is Satan influencing you, controlling you? And he says, it's not that Satan told you to lie to me, to the leaders of the church, Satan influenced you to lie to God the Holy Spirit and keep back some of the price of the land. Peter said, if you were the owner, it was under your control. And when you sold it, all the money that you got from it was under your control. But you conceived this lie in your heart. You didn't lie to men, you lied to God. As we read in chapter four of Acts, and you read also in Acts chapter two, there was a system in the early church. It was voluntary. People who had food would share their food with other people. People who had clothing would share it. People who had money would share it. People who had a house or land would sell it and they would share it. But understand this was all voluntary. This is not socialism. This is not communism. This is not government directed. This is people choosing to help their fellow believers. And sometimes you would sell a piece of property and you would get a certain amount of money and you would choose to donate a portion of that money. There's no problem with that. The problem is not the donation. The problem is the heart. Nobody's making you give a donation. But because you feel a kinship, 
a connection with your fellow believers they chose to give. So the problem is that Ananias and Sapphira had sold this piece of property for some amount of money, and we have no idea how much it was. So let's make up a number. Let's say that they sold it for $2,000. And when they brought their offering to give for the support of other believers, they gave $1,000. And that's fine. But the problem is they wanted everybody to believe that the sale price was the 1000 not the 2000 That's the lie, not the amount. It's the heart. I want credit for a big thing, and I'm going to do a little thing. We said at the beginning, we live in a pretend world. We live in a dishonest world. We live in a world that wants applause for everything. We even want applause for things we don't do. Why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? In verse 5, when he heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. Great fear came over all who heard it. When you first read it, you say, yeah, well, no kidding. The guy just lied and he's dead. Great fear. But this is not a joke. This is how seriously do we take honesty before the Lord. Died. So, in a culture where you don't embalm bodies, you bury them quickly in the Middle East. It's hot. They literally wrapped him up and went out and buried him. Then it says, three hours later, they had a conversation with the wife, Sapphira. And you're asking, where was she? I have no idea. You know what one person guesses? She's out shopping with the money they kept. I have no idea. But she comes back three hours later. She has no idea what's happened. So Peter goes to her and says, tell me, hey, Ananias said you sold your property. Yeah, yeah, we did. He says, good. Your husband said you sold it for X dollars in hours made up number $2,000. Oh, yeah, 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 that was the price. Knowing what wasn't the price. See, whoever thought of this scheme first, husband or wife, we have no idea. But whoever thought of it first brought the other one in on it. Because every time I fall into sin, it, affects me and my relationship with the Lord, but guess what else? It affects the people around me. Yeah, that was the price. Guess what that is? It's a lie. So we begin to do a little psychology and you say, what, what is a lie, by the way? Well, I don't have to tell you what the dictionary says. Untruthful, dishonest, intentionally false statements. This was not a mistake. This was not a miscalculation. This was a lie. Do you remember what Jesus said, John chapter eight, whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, talking about the devil and he is a liar and the father of lies. So guess what? Every lie we say and every lie we hear has demonic origins. So if that's what a lie is, what is truth? Follow along here. Truth, that which is true or in accordance with fact and reality. Well, if Satan is the father of lies, who is truth? Jesus is not just the father of truth. He is the truth. That's what he said in John chapter 14. Now, nobody thinks it's cool to be lied to. A lot of people are okay lying, but they don't think it's cool to be lied to. See, then you ask the question, why do people lie? Well, again, psychology tells us first reason is to avoid punishment. Everybody who's ever had a four-year-old or has been a four-year-old understands exactly, or a 14-year-old understands what this is about. You lie to avoid punishment. 
No, officer, I wasn't speeding. No. You lied to conceal reward or benefit. Well, that was the case in this exact story. You got money for yourself to keep, but you wanted the applause and the credit for giving it all away as if you were so generous in sealing a reward or benefit. Protecting someone from harm, the phrase don't be a snitch, that's why some people lie. Self-protection or promotion, boasting, I mean, that's, again, that's our world today. We live in a lying world where it's about self-promotion. Maintaining privacy, some people lie. No, I didn't do that. No, I don't own that car. No, no, no. Maintaining privacy, the thrill of it all. Some people just lie to see if they can get away with it. To see if they can get elected to office, by the way. Okay. Some people lie to avoid embarrassment. I don't want you to know what I did. I don't want you to find out. Or some people lie because it's polite. Oh, yes, that is a nice shirt you're wearing. Yes, that's very nice. You lie because it's really not a nice shirt. <laughs> but you're trying to be polite. Okay, so these are the reasons people lie. In this case, they're concealing their reward or their benefit. So we live in a dishonest world, but we've learned that it's a 2,000-year-old problem, and before that, it's a 3,400-year-old problem. So that's why when... Peter says to the wife, did you sell it for X dollars? And she said, oh yeah, that was the price. Then Peter says in verse nine, why have you agreed together? Why did you and your husband make an arranged plan to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Now, what does that mean? Put the spirit of the Lord to the test. I wonder how much I can get away with before God will notice or God will punish me. Why would I obey if I think I can get away with disobeying? Why have you put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband at the door, they are right here. They will carry you out as well. Immediately she fell and breathed her last. And the young men came in, found her dead, carried her out, and buried her beside her husband. And again, you get to verse 11, and it says, Great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard of these things. Now, for you trivia buffs, this is the first time the word church appears, in this case, in the book of Acts. Ecclesia is the word in Greek, iglesia in Espanol, the word that means the called out ones. And if you notice in verse 12, it says, at the hands of many apostles, the many signs and wonders were taking place among the people. They were all with one accord in Solomon's portico. So let me show you a photograph. This is the model of the temple of Herod in the days of Jesus. I've showed you this picture a lot. See where the arrow's pointing? That's called Solomon's portico. Lots of gospel stories take place there. The most famous one you know about is when Jesus came in and found them stealing from people by robbing them in the exchange rate when they were buying their sacrifices. And Jesus threw over the tables of the money changers and said, don't make my father's house into a robber's den. That took place in Solomon's portico. All of that took place right there showing you what these people didn't have a building for their church. So ecclesia, the church didn't mean a building. It meant a group of believers. And fear came over the group of believers. Why? I wonder how God's going to deal with me when I lie. I wonder how God's going to deal with us in the future. And for those of you who have read this story before, I think you've been wondering a question. And if today's the first time you've ever heard this story, I think your question is going to be, why was this punishment so severe? We have cases where people are disobedient to the Lord all through the scriptures. That's one of the interesting things and honest things about the scriptures is they tell you when people mess up. Why was the punishment so severe? Well, we're dealing with, as we've talked about, covetousness, hypocrisy, and a desire for praise. But look, this is spiritual. 
not just relational. See the quote from John Stott? If the devil's first tactic was to destroy the church by force from without, his second was to destroy it by falsehood from within. You know why God dealt with the people in the early church so severely? It's because he says, if I don't do this now, this new vision, this new expression of the people of God will fail at the beginning. Why was it so severe? Because we need to be reminded that God hates sin. Also, as we mentioned a couple of slides, it says the Lord judges sin severely at the beginning of a new period in salvation history. Just after the tabernacle was erected, God killed the priest named Nadav and Avahu for trying to present false fire to the Lord. That's in Leviticus chapter 10. We talked about Achan being stoned to death in Joshua chapter 7. And 1 Corinthians 10 says, be a warning for this. Did you know that phony spirituality is contagious? If we have people who are trying to live for the Lord, and we see people who pretend to follow the Lord, but it's fake and it's phony. So you have a group of believers living together, some honestly and some dishonestly. The question is, which group is going to influence the other? And sadly, what we know from peer pressure and what we know from being a teenager and being an adult is that liars become role models. Cheaters become role models. Why should I be honest and suffer whatever that might cause me if they can lie and get away with it? It's the problem of society today. It's the problem within churches today. And God was not going to let that hinder and damage the beginning of his church. So let's ask the question, what did Ananias and Sapphira not do wrong? Own property, there was nothing wrong with that. Sell property, nothing wrong with that. Earn money from selling the property, nothing wrong with that. Giving a donation to the church, nothing wrong with that. Giving a large donation to the church, nothing wrong with any of that. So what did they do wrong? They chose to lie to God the Holy Spirit. Notice they didn't lie to Peter. Peter confronted them because the Spirit told him. But they didn't lie to him, they lied to the Spirit. Why? Because they said, hey, we sold it for 2,000 but he, or 1,000 and here's the whole money, but they really sold it for more, right? They lied to God. We need to be reminded. Man sees actions God sees hearts. Now you may not have any land to sell, but you have decisions to make every single day. I may not have a business to sell, but I have to make decisions every single day. Am I gonna be honest before the Lord? Or am I gonna try to see what I can get away with? What did they do wrong? They lied to God, the Holy Spirit. They conspired together to deceive. They made an arrangement together. They made a deal. And they tried to take credit and applause that they did not deserve. So if the first big question that comes out of this story is why was the punishment so severe, the next big question that comes out is does this type of judgment happen today? We saw it happen in Achan's life book of Joshua. Here we see it in the book of Acts. But we look around and we say, well, I don't, I don't see this happening today. I guess God is different than he was back then. No. Book of Hebrews remind us that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He didn't change. 
So if God who punishes sin doesn't change because he is perfectly holy and mankind who is sinful has been a liar for over 3,000 years, what's changed? All we can say is that we live in a time of God's mercy. It's not that it's not sinful to lie. It's not that God is tolerating our dishonesty. It's a time of his mercy. And see, it says on that second bullet there, we must be thankful for God's mercies and we need to remember we are not deserving of God's mercies. We tell him that we need it, we want it. We quote Lamentations 3, your loving kindness has never ceased, your compassions never fail, your mercies are new every morning, great is your faithfulness. We tell him we deserve it, but we don't. We don't get to demand that God forgive us. We do not get to demand that God overlook our sin. So we tell you this epic tale to ask, what does this have to do with this culture? What does this have to do with us in America today? Well, by all accounts of the story, Ananias and Sapphira were followers of Jesus. They were members of this church. They were believers. And even as followers of Jesus, they faced temptation and the sinful influence of Satan. Guess what? Even as followers of Jesus today, every single one of us, guess what we face? We face temptation. And everything that we do, everything that we watch, everything that we listen to, every person that we are around, we face temptation. And we face the influence of Satan. And if you believe this is a spiritual battle in the first century of the church because the enemy of God was trying to defeat the church of God in the first century, if you believe that to be true, let me tell you what's true in the 21st century. The enemy of God wants to defeat the church of God. And how is he going to do it? By leading people who love Jesus to walk away from him. See, Ananias and Sapphira could have listened to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We read the scriptures a lot. We say, come on, guys, what's wrong with you? Can't you see it? Don't do that. And what I think the Holy Spirit of God is looking at you and me today and say, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't take credit when it's not yours. Don't take applause when you didn't earn it. Don't lie just to impress somebody. Don't say you did it when you didn't do it. Ananias and Sapphira could have followed the example of generosity and honesty displayed by the others in the church. See, while we face the temptation of the people who are away from the Lord, we can also be influenced not by that negative peer pressure, but but the positive peer pressure. That's why we tell our kids and our teenagers it's important that you find friends to hang around who also love and serve God. Guess what? Adults, old people, it also matters who you hang around. Will they walk with you toward the Lord or away from the Lord? Bottom line, Ananias and Sapphira could have chosen not to sin. But you know what? Trey could have chosen not to sin. Marty could have chosen not to sin. Wayne could have chosen not to sin. Every single one of us every day has to say, God, please guide me in your paths of righteousness. Why? Because my sin affects my walk with God. Guess what else it does? It affects my family's walk with God. It affects my church's walk with God. We need to hear this story today because the enemy of God still hates the church of God. And the enemy of God still wants to destroy the church of God. So we finish with a prayer. Psalm 120, verse 2. Your homework assignment, should you choose to pray this prayer this week. Psalm 120, verse 2. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips 
from a deceitful tongue? What if I start asking before I say a sentence or type a sentence, is this true? Guess what would happen to the ministry of the Christian world? If just those who follow Jesus would start telling nothing but the truth. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. May that be our prayer. Bow with me, please. As we bow our hearts, I'm going to ask some of the folks from our prayer ministry, they're going to come to the front here. They'll be ready to pray with you when the service is over, if you'd like. Our God, we bow our hearts before you and we do pray. We do pray that we would be the generation of Christ followers who have learned from the example of 3,000 years ago and 2,000 years ago and yesterday that the enemy of God hates the church of God and wants the people of God to walk away from the truth of God. Would you help us please to be honest? To be generous, not to get applause, but because you have given so much to us. Father, thank you for this story. Even if we don't understand how you work, we understand that you are always true and you are always right. Help us not to lie to you, the Holy Spirit. Deliver us from lying lips and a deceitful tongue and let it start with us today. This we pray in the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Thank you for being here today. Remember our folks are here to pray with you if you'd like. We have our small groups about to meet. Hope to see you this week. Thanks for coming.